You're listening to A Pleasure Podcast, a podcast network revolutionizing the conversation around sex and relationships. For more, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. What might be natural, more quote unquote natural for me, is to want to sleep with lots and lots of different people. Um, But that means I have to pay attention and it means if I want to do that ethically, I have to, you know, have systems in place and have, and, you know, actually pay attention to people's hearts and, you know, all everybody else involved. And I was just really lucky that I found a community and, you know, different systems for making that possible at a quite young age. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multiamory Podcast, we're addressing some important questions that we've seen come up more and more over the past few years. These are questions about polyamory and sexism and feminism. For this discussion, we are super excited to have author Lori Penny joining us. Lori is an author, journalist, and screenwriter from London. Uh, who's known for Bitch Doctrine, fantastic book, as well as Unspeakable Things and many others, uh, and probably more soon in the future. Laurie, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks. It's great to be here. Really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's definitely hard to introduce you because honestly, you're just so prolific mm-hmm. Gosh. as a writer. And it feels like you've worn many, many different mm. flavors of writer hats, if I'm allowed to mix really good metaphors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's funny when like, um, when, uh, when a lot of writers describe their job, but actually you'll hear them go, it's like, I'm an author, screenwriter, columnist. It's like, you, that's just different words for writer. You have right. a thesaurus. Mm. Well done. Like, you it's know many different words. I see that will be useful in your job, which is a writer. <laughs> but, you yeah, know, I'm out here in L.A. at the moment uh, doing screenwriting, part of the time, at least, um, still working on the political articles and all of that stuff. And, and they feed into each other a lot, these different kinds of work. But I'm still kind of very much keyed into feminist politics and uh, all this activist stuff I've been doing since the start. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's really like exciting to come and talk to people like you who think about this, who think about it a lot. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, to bridge that, you know, mostly you've been known as a journalist, Mm -hmm. as a feminist writer, but you've also identified as polyamorous Mm -hmm. and practiced polyamory for several years. So why don't you just go ahead and tell us a little bit about that? This is great. I don't often get to have this conversation when I'm sober. (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, like, um, yeah, no, I, um, I started doing polyamory properly when I was, I think, 21. And I'm wow. 30, I'm 34 in a couple of weeks. So that's, it's quite a long time, really. And I've, uh, I've been poly most of my adult life, certainly almost all of my dating life. And, um, it's, um, and I've also done poly on um, on several different continents because I've moved mm. around a lot. So I've, you know, had some experience of what it's like. Well, lots of different, you know, developed world places, at least lots of different places in America. You know, I lived in Boston for a bit. I lived in New York. I lived in San Francisco and in, I'm now in L.A. I've also been in Berlin for a while. And uh, London is where mostly I've lived and um, it's been interesting looking at how poly is different in all those different places. Um, I would say um, I may be biased, but London is pretty good in terms of the poly scene in London. And honestly, I think the reason for that is that we don't take ourselves seriously. Um, (laughs) Honestly, like after a while, um, there is a bit, my friend Quinn Norton um, says that, look, well, one of the things she says is the internet is turning everybody into Californians and you're not qualified. (laughs) And it's true. I I think all, honestly, I think all British people could stand to be a bit more Californian and vice versa. 
Um, what does California is, entail versus yeah, Britain? Yeah, I need to, I need to, I need you to lay that very clearly. I'm like, which pieces of being Californian? Because I don't know if you want all of this. <laughs> you know, That's but, true. Like, look, Americans, you take yourselves very seriously, which mm. is in many ways a good thing. It means that you're not afraid in the way that at least British people often are of looking silly. And one of the one of the things that happens with that is that sometimes you do look silly. But the other th- the other thing that happens is that you make a lot of daring art and culture and mm. you know, all of the things that people don't do for fear that they will look silly are much easier to do in America, um, which is you know one of the good things about Americans take themselves seriously. However, with some kinds of you know, what I'm just going to call hippie nonsense, which is, very, <laughs> which is very much where I live the whole of my life, right? I, uh, I live with hippies. I love hippies. Uh, I'm for some reason still not really a hippie. I, I'm kind of resolutely identifying as a goth. Um, but, um, <laughs> some hippie nonsense could do with some a little bit of British not taking itself so seriously some of the time, mm. particularly when it comes to gender politics and, you know, mm. the politics of intersectionality, because, um, you know, there are some bits, look, there are some bits of any dating culture which are inherently silly and everything's just a lot better if you learn to laugh at that. Um, it's uh, like we've all met the guy with eight girlfriends and somebody really just needs to sit him down and say, just because you have got eight girlfriends, just because you can, doesn't necessarily mean you should. It's like, um, <laughs> it's like the atom bomb. It's like we were so concerned with wondering if we could. We never stopped to think if we should. It's like, maybe right. you shouldn't. Thank you, Jeff Goldblum. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I definitely have felt that for a long time I've been itching for like who's going to be the the right comedian for this particular community. And I think there's definitely been people who've who've um, gotten close to that. Before we started recording, we were talking about Chris Fleming and his amazing song about um, <laughs> about you know polyamorous people and just things like that. You but it, have bad hair. Sorry, just because <laughs> exactly. I have bad hair doesn't mean that I'm uh-huh. polyamorous. My sister, who is not polyamorous, sent me that video. <laughs> And it was a savage, savage burn. And it's, it's entirely accurate. I love it's it. a classic, for sure. Yeah. I, I'm curious to ask, you know, you talked about when you were young, kind of first learning about feminism, mm-hmm. um, you know, that for you, it started with reading feminist theory. Mm-hmm. You know, that was a very important step before actually learning about, okay, how does this actually play out in practice? How does this play out in my life? How does this play out in the community? Mm-hmm. And I'm curious about if it was a similar journey for you with polyamory. You know, did you start from a place of like reading? I mean, like I did, like read the ethical oh, slut first thing foremost and oh, sex with Dawn, you know, did, yeah. and kind of, yeah, dive into the theory and then, you know, and then see how it plays out in the life. Was it similar for no, you there as no, well? No, not at all. Actually, um, the way it started was um, I was 21 and my then partner uh, told me about it and I was like, oh, there's a word for the thing I want to do. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> cool. um, because yeah. honestly, previously, um, actually, when I was I mean, I've not really talked about this before. It's not an awful thing. But when I was 20, uh, for the first and only time in my life, I cheated on someone. It was somebody I just got together with. Um, we were then, you know, we were monogamous, just got together and, and I cheated on somebody and was also the cause of cheating. And I felt terrible about that. And I also felt that there must be a better way of doing this stuff. And mm. one of the reasons I, as soon as I heard about Polly, I was like, oh, 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 this makes so much sense. Mm. It's like, well, yeah, this, um, it seems like this will be a much better fit for me because I don't see myself, you know, I've never really seen myself in a situation where I want to have, you know, just that one person in my life fulfilling every single role ever. And as soon as I heard that that was a possibility, I, um, I sort of went after it. I started reading some of the theory, but honestly, the theory books have never really spoken to me. Um, mm. most of them, at least my favorite one is, uh, Meg John Barker's book, Rewriting the Rules. Um, in mm. part, honestly, in part, and, and I'm sorry if this is mean, it's partly just because, you know, Sex at Dawn and the Ethical Slut are lovely, but they are terribly Californian. Terribly <laughs> Californian. Oh my goodness. Um, do they um, take themselves way too seriously? Very seriously. <laughs> and, it's, and it's adorable. You know, you've got to give... And the trouble with hippies is they are right. 
they're right about almost everything. But like, it's um, but yeah, Sex at Dawn. Um, I think I got to the chapter where he was, but he and or she, I don't know who, which of them wrote that chapter, were describing like maybe um, we all make sex noises because bonobos have to signal to mm. each other something about baboons, and I was like, oh, for goodness sake, <laughs> or maybe pornography. Mm. Um, but you no, know, what I like about it in terms of um, certainly in terms of like feminist thought and feminist theory is you know we are all. I mean, look, I spent the first five years of being poly hearing a lot about bonobos. Everybody wants to talk about so bonobos. Hot, like ten years ago, yeah, yeah it's super hot. <laughs> bonobos See, are totally over. because. <laughs> In Sex at Dawn, the chapter that gave the very, very detailed descriptions of like the relative penis and testicle size of <laughs> different primates mm. was like one of my favorite diagrams in that book. Well, I mean, you don't really need a reason to like a diagram uh, like that. You know? Of penises and testicles? <laughs> yeah, of, of the various sizes. There you go. We, you, you love what you love. Um, but look, I'm really interested in even evolutionary biology and was well, sociobiology and the, you know, the way people relate the theory of um, the theory of evolution to people's real lives and mm. so much of it. And one of the things you can get if you read the introduction to sex of dawn is one of the things they're saying is, look, a lot of this is pretty circumstantial and some mm. of it is silly and doesn't make sense, but it makes no less sense and it's no less silly or circumstantial than any of the other things that people use to justify why, you know, men are supposed to want to shag everything, the women want mm. to commit and the women don't even like sex, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. So I am, um, you know, I've, uh, I did a couple of courses in, um, in, uh, biotechnology and you know the the whole idea of basically the line is that we don't see animals as they are we say we see them as we are and um the idea that you can read anything that is quote unquote natural about human behavior from looking at how your primates behave is um i think it deserves unpacking i'm not sure mm. taking that as red doesn't really work for me both as you know as a feminist thinker and as somebody who is doing poly in their daily life because yeah i mean i understand why it's important to people to believe that something is quote unquote natural um and to believe that you know a way they live is not because we live mm -hmm. in a society where natural is synonymous with good Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. where or synonymous with you know what jesus wants um but you know i don't do uh I don't do polyamory because it's natural. Mm. I do it because it works for me and it works for the people I love. And it's the way I can get the most fun and experience and adventure out of life whilst hurting people and myself least. Um, mm -hmm. And none of that is to do with, um, and, and I'm not sure primates make that kind of calculation. Um, maybe they do. I'm assuming. We know of. Yeah. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. yeah it's... Maybe, maybe not. I think that's something that we've definitely talked about on this show before, and I do think is so important when people get into that mm -hmm. debate about what's natural and what's not, you know, and it happens with everything, right? It's like the keto diet is more natural, so therefore better, <laughs> or non-monogamy, or, yeah. or patriarchy, or like mm -hmm. whatever it is, making this <laughs> argument, like you said, that it's natural, therefore it's good, is just, it's just so absurd. And I think that it sucks because what they're saying in Sex at Dawn, I think, is so valuable to people who feel like they've been taught monogamy is natural and yet they struggle with it. So something must be wrong with me. And I think poking yeah, holes exactly. in that is so key. But if we just try to turn it around into like, no, this is the natural thing. It's just. Oh, yeah, of course. I absolutely right. get the reason for it. And it's the same with, you know, different kinds of sexual identity and sexual preference, mm. especially when you're trying to, you know, establish yourself as an interest group and, you know, establish mm. your authority in, in the cultural landscape. You often find people starting out saying, you know, we were just born this way. You know, it is natural to be like this. We can't help it. And sometimes that is almost you, it's very understandable, both as, you know, a way to, a way to justify the way you are to yourself. Exactly like you said, um, you know, if you've been taught that, you know, this thing is natural, therefore good, and therefore you are, are unnatural and therefore wrong. Right. I totally get it. But, um, you know, the born this way argument only takes you so far because I think, you know, 
One of the things that is even more threatening to the status quo is the idea that, for example, someone might not be born a assigned male at birth person fancying men. They might just decide they'd like to shag a bloke one day mm. and that might be fine. And that, um, doesn't, that kind of explodes all the categories that we have for how humans should do sex and love each other even more so, at least right now. And, um, and yeah. the same, like polyamory for me is, um, I don't know how much of any of my sexuality is quote unquote natural. It's certainly, mm a choice to me to, to be, you know, to be ethically non-monogamous. And, you know, for me, so much of poly is not just about who you sleep with and who you date. It's about how you treat the people you sleep with and the people you date. Like, yeah. and I, I certainly, mm -hmm. for me, like the big, the big driving, I don't know, the big driving force in some ways has always been, and I'm, I've definitely not got this right all the time, but the driving force has been to, to be a decent human and to, to not hurt people. And I just felt that, you know, what might be natural, more quote unquote natural for me is to want to sleep with lots and lots of different people. Um, but that means I have to pay attention and it means I ha if I want to do that ethically, I have to, you know, have systems in place and have, and, you know, actually pay attention to people's hearts and, you know, all everybody else involved. And I was just really lucky that I found a community and, you know, different systems for making that possible at a quite young age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, it, it makes a huge difference, I think, coming to it. Mm -hmm. relatively young for sure i mean because 21 is also about the age that yeah. that i kind of first started going on this journey as well oh, really? and jeez oh, yeah yeah now actually actually myself and laura i think our, our dates almost kind of line up <laughs> as far as um like when the polyamory journey began and um i think we could have a whole separate conversation on how the community feels different from back then as how it feels now um oh yes but but yeah i mean i do think that yeah having access to that when you're 21 or finding your way towards that when you're 21, yeah. I think just makes such a big mm. difference. It's, and it's, you know, now I have a lot more data points and I've experienced different community, different versions of poly communities. I've got more, I can compare each thing to. Um, one thing I wanted to share actually is some, um, if we're talking about gender and what people think is natural and normal. So um, a few years ago, I lived in a big poly group house um, where almost everybody in the house was both polyamorous and some form of bisexual. And we were, it was lots of fun. And um, although we did have a kind of light guideline, maybe don't sleep with housemates. That's, you know, recipe for some trouble. Mm -hmm. um, we mostly stuck to it. But um, <laughs> it was about half assigned male people and a half assigned female people. And we had a, just a conversation over dinner one day. And it turned out that about coming out to your parents. And it turned out that almost universally, people who were girls, when they come out to their parents as bi, that was not really a problem. Mm. But when they come out as poly, that was a problem. And for the mm. boys, it was the opposite. For the boys, the idea for their parents or for other people in their social circle that they'd be shagging a lot of people was fine. But the idea that they might shag a boy was not fine at all. Um, but for the women, the idea that, you know, you might maybe kiss a girl was, was okay because that's not threatening to, you know, patriarchy. And of course, you know, if you're bisexual, you end up with a man anyway. Obviously that's the, that's the social idea. But the mm -hmm. idea that you might be having lots of sex with different people, you know, certainly, you know, when I talked to my family about it, at least initially, um, you know, they were very worried about me. Mm. And I think it took them a long, long time to understand. And I think I'm going to hope that they now understand that this is not something that is, you know, putting me in any danger. But I've, you know, a lot of the women and assigned female people I know who are polyamorous have had similar conversations with friends and family members where, where the assumption is just that you're being exploited. Even if yeah. you don't think you're being oh, exploited, yeah. you are. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. That's funny that you point out the, like the assumption of danger, you know, 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that that tracks with, with my experience for sure. Yeah. And Jace like, and I on. opened up. Yeah. Uh, when Jace like five, six years. Uh, no. Yeah. Right around the time that we were no, doing the best movie the year before. 
seven years or so. Yeah, more than seven years ago. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> but definitely my uh, my mother was like, oh, so this is his idea and blah, blah, blah. And it right, is yeah. kind of always that assumption. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we had uh, Cherie and Shanae from um, Black Poly Pride on our show. I think, Ooh. when was this? This was uh, 30 what or so time? episodes ago. Yeah, it was a, it was a little while <laughs> you ago. You could have said 30 years <laughs> ago, know. and I would have believed yeah, it. Yeah, time this year <laughs> is out the window. But I, Cherie said, I, I have this quote. It was I wrote down a bunch of quotes from that um, specific episode because it was really great. But she said, womanism is essential to the modern day polyamorous. Mm-hmm. Polyamory asserts the notion that women have the same rights as men. And I wondered if you could could kind of talk about that a little like if you agree with that sentiment i know you write about feminism a -hmm. lot and so i'm interested like your intersection with that and polyamory what you think about that i think feminism and womanism are absolutely essential to what to to really any community that you want to build with any kind of sense of universal human agency and healthy boundaries and actual community um i don't think that you have to be poly to be a feminist. Absolutely not. Sure. Um, Cause you know, not everybody is really not everybody is. Um, I did go through the very, very brief phase, you know, when I was 20 year old, uh, 21 year old baby poly, like everybody's polyamorous. Yeah. Everyone goes yeah. through the phase of like yeah. really waving the flag yeah. and thinking they know everything yeah. and they've solved relationships. Definitely. And then, yeah. and then you get yeah. the rude awakening the, in the face at some the point. The only polyamorous people who are allowed to say that are, you know, baby pollies i will not <laughs> the next time i hear some you know 50 year old poly dude try to tell me or anyone else that everybody's poly really don't you know um shut up gregory <laughs> like, it's, uh, no they're not i really have met people who are just monogamous and they've mm-hmm. tried to not me but that's just how they are um but i do think that the well firstly what is essential to feminism, to womanism, is the idea of sexual agency, however you come across that, however that, whatever that means in your life. And that does, you know, some people are asexual, but Mm -hmm. those people can have, those people are entitled to sexual agency as well. It just means asserting your boundaries and it being okay to not want certain things in your life. Polyamory for me is as much I don't want to put a negative spin on it. It's as much about what you don't want in your life as what you do. And Mm. for me, at least, it's about not wanting the traditional forms. So the traditional forms of kin making and family making that have, that I've been told are, you know, the expectation is on me to do that as a woman. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I very much never wanted that. And polyamory is a way to not have that, but still, but have something else, have something, you know, bigger and freer and, you know, more networked. Um, I always felt that the pressure to be specifically to be a girlfriend, um, because I'm sadly really quite straight. I have no idea how it happened. Um, but yeah, the pressure to be a girlfriend in a, uh, in the disaster of modern heterosexuality is a really, was a really big pressure that was too much for me. And, um, polyamory lets me not have to be everything, particularly, um, the freedom to not have to be everything to a, any of the millennial 20 something men I have known and loved mm-hmm. has been a real gift in my life. Um, because I think a lot of women and femmes, particularly young women and femmes, feel a lot of pressure to do that girlfriend work, to be, you know, doing the emotional labor, the, oh, yeah. you know, the domestic labor, the, 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 and sex can be part of that emotional labor, um, because it is so keyed into status and self-worth, particularly for a straight men. And I think for me, Polly has been a way of, of hacking that system. Um, I'm going to use that because uh, uh, one of my exes uh, really, really hates it when I use the phrase hacking to describe anything that isn't <laughs> fixing a computer. Um, so it's like, so you don't like it when I hack language, do you? Right. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think for me, 
I have certainly done my very, very best to do polyamory in a feminist way. And it is essential for, it's not essential for my feminist theory, but it's essential for my feminist praxis in that it's a big part of my life. Um, and I mean, also, honestly, um, I, it's been a way for me to build community with women. Cause, mm. and, and again, maybe this is just me being starry eyed, but one of the things I hate most about, you know, monogamous heterosexuality and really any heterosexuality is the way it pits women against each other to compete for the attention of men. And that is, I mean, that's the case. You, that's still the case in a lot of poly communities, obviously. But one thing I've always consciously done, and it's a personal rule for me, um, I will not date anyone or sleep with anyone who has a female partner who doesn't know me, who hasn't, you know, just, mm. you know, I will always reach out to the partners unless there's some specific reason why I shouldn't, um, or at least ask people to be given the heads up. And um, that's, that's not this, I'm not saying that everybody should do it that way. I'm just, you know, it's really important for me. It's really important for me that the, that my female metamors, that there's some kind of solidarity there. And honestly, I've met, I've met a lot of my best friends that way. Oh, that's because, great. Because, um, there are some polyamorous men out there. Well, there's some men out there in general who, while they may not be, you know, bastions of, you know, sexual ethics themselves, they have fantastic taste in women, just fantastic <laughs> taste in women. <laughs> and like, yeah, I, honestly, I was writing a different thing, uh, a, about, you know, about some of my friends and, um, who, it was just a piece about who I've been keeping in touch with over quarantine and how we've been speaking. And, um, and I was going through, I was like, oh yeah, there's this person and we met because, you know, we both dated this guy. And then there's this person who we met and we both engaged to this person. And I was like, mm. hang on, there's a pattern here. <laughs> like, honestly, like a lot of my close friends, um, are people I've met like that. And sometimes, you know, I don't speak to the guy anymore. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, it's, um, for me, I've tried to do it in a way that is first and foremost about building female solidarity within a situation of, you know, because polyamory doesn't make structural power imbalance magically disappear. Mm, and, uh, I hate it when people try to pretend that it does. Um, but it does make it easier to, to reach out to people and to build community. And, um, yeah, that's been, that's been really important for me. And, um, honestly, um, if I'd not done that, I probably would have got laid a bit more, uh, but <laughs> I don't mind. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's funny. I, I think that, you know, the way, the way that I've always come down on it is, you know, feeling if we're taking this question of, you know, like, do you have to be feminist? Hmm to be polyamorous or do you have to be feminist to, to be a good polyamorous or things like that? And I know the way that I've always kind of squared it in my mind is like, you know, you don't have to, of course, but it just feels like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're going to have more fun maybe mm. yep. and probably going to be easier to a certain extent if you are living out feminist principles while also practicing polyamory yeah. as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's um, honestly, I mean, look, personally, I don't sleep with people who don't see me as a full human being. That's just a, you know, I, I require a certain level. Honestly, I had this, I had a real, almost a fight with a friend the other day. Um, when I said to her, like, I just, I just don't sleep with right wingers. I just never do. Um, a friend who's also like what I, I self define as slutty. Um, mm -hmm. another like slutty left friend. And, um, like, but that's, isn't that prejudice? You know, it, she, this is what she was saying. You know, isn't that, you know, I, I'm, she was genuinely shocked. She was like, I just thought you were really open and oh. welcoming of all kinds of people. And, you know, I would, you know, would never like close myself off to anyone like that. And I was equally shocked that she would even consider, you know, going to bed with somebody who didn't believe in like, you know, abortion rights or, I mean, even if they were, I mean, they'd have to be really hot. Like really hot. <laughs> I did, oh, and, and I confess, God, no, honestly, no. I um, I don't sleep with people who aren't. If I mean, look, you don't have to have read all the feminist texts back to back. You don't even have to call yourself a feminist. A lot of people live by feminist principles. With yeah, you know, feminism is something you do. It's not something you are. Um, 
Mm. I don't like to sleep with people who don't think that women and femmes are really people, partly because they're generally terrible in bed. They're really bad in bed. <laughs> like, yep, mm-hmm. sounds about right. And, you know, yeah. even some of the people who are self-professed feminists can be real bad in bed because everybody is, you know, as this internalized patriarchy can really do a number on your head. It can be a real boner killer. Um, and, you know, mm-hmm. everybody's had to wrangle that kind of stuff. But, yeah, I just don't and I wouldn't. So I can't, I can't honestly say what it would have been like to do polyamory in in a non-feminist way with, in terms of who I relate to because I've generally selected my partners quite carefully on that basis. Not always, but generally. Mm. And um, it turns out that there are actually quite a lot of decent, kind, feminist or genuine, generally like feminist affiliated people out there. And um, you can really get laid really quite a lot without, you know, whilst, you know, putting that selection filter on. Well, so I think that's actually a good segue into what I want to ask about. And I want to ask about uh, contradictions Mm -hmm. that exist kind of within the intersection of like feminism and polyamory. And I think that in the world that we're living in now, uh, where we're consuming so much content and so much interaction online, I think that as a species, we've just become so uncomfortable mm-hmm. with gray areas and contradictions. You know, we want it to it's be a one or the other. No, we want it to be, yes, we want it to be one or another, you know? And so, of course, there's the argument out there that, well, polyamory is inherently feminist. You know, if you look at the community, there's so many women and femmes who are in positions mm-hmm. of leadership, who are speaking, who are writing. Um, you know, it prioritizes the sexual and relationship agency for everybody. Um, versus, of course, also the argument like, no, polyamory, it's, it can be supported by and driven by the patriarchy and by privilege and by these power structures and stuff like that. And the weird thing being that it's like, of course, we can point to very real world examples of both of those being true at the same time. And so I'd definitely love to hear Um, your thoughts on that. Again, I think it is so true. I think we always want to think that everything is either completely good or completely bad. Um, Look, the, um, what I try, one thing I often say to people when I'm trying to explain why I'm polyamorous to them is that the the problem with polyamory is the same as the problem with monogamy. It's the same as the problem with any rule system for how people relate, which is there is no perfect system that is going to assume, is going to guarantee that everybody will be decent to each other and nobody will ever break their break their heart ever again. And you know that's the delusion of both systems, which is that you know people thinking, oh my god, well if we got if you're upset or if you got your heart broken, then you must just not have followed the rules properly. And you know just you know let's pay more attention and do the rules better. No, um, there is no. There is no system, no way of interacting that guarantees uh, an end to human malice and, you know, human and moral cowardice and people being lazy and selfish and stupid. But polyamory makes it easier to talk about those things. And it makes it gives you more options to design your own way of interacting, which is one of the reasons I think polyamory is, is inherently queer. If it's nothing else. Polyamory is kind of, I mean, I really don't want to appropriate stuff, but in a lot of different ways and in a lot of different communities I've been part of, polyamory has kind of functioned a little bit like queerness for straight people. I mean, that's a, that's a really big generalization. Interesting, Um, right. But it's like, it's a way of, you know, exploding the binary, normative, traditional monogamous partnership family system whilst still having straight type sex. Um, All of the things that come along with straight sex in the world um, don't have to, don't have to. Um, And I think polyamory is part of a kind of acknowledging that, which is, I mean, look, one thing I have seen And this was part, this has been part of some communities I've been part of and not others. The best communities I've been part of have often started out with, you know, mostly straight people. But over time, not just the women, but the men as well have started to kind of open up an experiment. Um, Hmm. And you don't often see that 
in you know in lots of communities but i feel that like polyamory opens the door for lots of lots of different things like that and that if you can hold space not just for you know not just for women to experiment but also for men to experiment which i think is a lot harder because you know of internalized homophobia um i think that's a sign that things are working uh or at least something is working yeah it's it's funny that you mentioned that because i think that i've seen that be used both as the reason why look obviously polyamory is this horrible thing that's destroying the moral <laughs> fiber of our people good. uh versus uh, right <laughs> good uh versus on the other side i would see that as a positive and i think that that what you were hitting on is like it, it's like okay as as a man if i want to uh, experiment with like maybe i could be sexual with men i'm i'm not sure i've always kind of thought maybe i could but i've also liked women and that's just easier and everyone tells me that's what i should do and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do that then. And it's like, if I wanted to try that, it's, it feels like, well, I've just got to decide I'm all the way gay. And yes. like, what if I don't end up liking it as much? Then I'm stuck and now I'm just gay. And you're catching and, your and cards. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Right. And that, that I think that this, you know, this happens too, to a lesser extent with women too, where it's just like mm. such a big step to go like, I'm going to go by myself with a guy and have sex. That's terrifying if that's not something I've done before. And I do think yeah. polyamory, it kind of adds a little bit of this like safety net. It adds some other options. Just, like ways there, there to, to get idea, in and try that. There is the idea, isn't there, in culture that like dick is so bewitching that once you've tried it, you'll no. never go back. Yeah. Never, never. Like oh, yeah. bewitching's <laughs> alright. <laughs> yeah. The name of <laughs> yeah, exactly. The idea that you can't, you can't touch even one because you'll never go back. And um, and at yeah. the same time, you know, le like female sexuality and you know and lesbian sexuality is continually just like thought of as not a thing. Like so yeah. that you know, if women want to experiment, yeah. that's fine. They're not serious anyway. They're probably just doing it to show off. Um. I think it's intimidating though to people. I found mm -hmm. that in my own like journey of being bisexual mm -hmm. and like coming to terms with that and coming to terms with it, knowing uh, that I have to talk about it and to it, like exude that in yeah. a way and dating women and stuff. And, and mm -hmm. I feel like for some of my partners, it's been intimidating for them. Really? And I don't know why. Maybe just, yeah, like, it, they, at times they'll be like, yeah, okay, no problem. Like, that doesn't bother me. And then at times they'll be like, oh, actually, it's hard because I am not that. Right. I I have a penis. Right. right. It's, um, yeah, but I mean. I, it's an enigma. Yeah. It feels like within uh, Polly, there is more of a. There is more of an acceptance that you might not need to be absolutely every single thing that your partner wants and needs out of life. And in fact, that's a kind of, that's too much to put on any relationship. But again, yeah. that doesn't, you know, that doesn't account for human hearts. Yeah. It's, it's almost, I, I could see that within, like it's the, the stereotype, right? Is that within a heterosexual monogamous relationship that if the woman was like, oh, I want to fool around with other women, it's like, hell yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's super hot. And I think the the funny irony there, Emily, with, with what you're saying is that I could see that if you're in a monogamous relationship and that person is feminist enough mm. to get that that's a real relationship too, yeah. then suddenly it becomes threatening. It's like yeah. almost ironically. Yeah, like, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're completely right. Huh. Well, yeah, because I, yeah, like you were saying, Lori, it's like for so long, I think female sexuality, and especially queer female sexuality, uh, has been offered up for yeah. the consumption yeah. of men, yeah. you know? And it's kind of like, even if I feel like I encounter a lot of straight men where it's like, maybe they don't even consciously have that thought of like, yes, I consume female sexuality. Like maybe they're just like, whatever, that's cool. It's not threatened to me. Like I'm fine with that. I can support that. Maybe that's even part of me being uh, supportive of my yeah. queer friends and stuff like that is supporting my queer female friend's sexuality. Um, but it's, yeah, it's like once it makes that switch to like, Oh wait, this is actually for my partner for, for their enjoyment and I mean, quote unquote consumption for lack of a better term, it's not for my consumption, that that's when I've seen a lot of straight guys yeah. really. Yeah, um, absolutely. When you, when you understand that it is mm -hmm. not, some things are not for you. 
Um, yeah, when it doesn't include them oh gosh, specifically. That, that, yeah, sorry, that sentiment. <laughs> Some things are not for you. That's been bouncing around my head mm. for a lot of things in regards to things like thinking yeah. about cultural appropriation so and, and appropriation of marginalization of like, it's okay if, if yeah. something's not for yeah, you. Yeah, like you don't need to have it all. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, when, when I was um, in my mid twenties, I was in a triad with um, a guy and another woman. And, um, and, and, you know, this guy, give him a break. He was 24 at the time. Okay. But like, I remember this one, we were walking back through London and the three of us together and we um we saw this couple straight couple um a white couple like sort of on a bicycle riding through the streets of soho and it was like a scene from like before midnight all of those films like she was she was sitting on, <laughs> I yeah, love those movies. she was she was <laughs> sitting on the handlebars and like her hair was black and neither of them were wearing helmets it was very dangerous but like yeah, you know there was if they were laughing the hair it was like a commercial and we just watched this sort of picture go by and uh uh my uh, my male partner was like huh well I've got two women, so there. And me and this other girl just turned, we did not, we gave him such shit like, for mm-mm. a couple. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, I, and, and I'm sure like a lot of uh, cis men coming into poly stuff for the first time encounter this, like, you know, it's a classic thing, but the reality of having two girlfriends and, you know, two girlfriends, you know, people who all sleep together is different than what you think it's good. Because if you do it right, like there are lots of times when we hang out and talk about him, not in a non Bechdel test way. And like, you know, <laughs> if like, if he ever does something to upset one of us, the other one is going to have something to say about it. And like, it's, uh, it was, I think a little more threatening. I think it's fair to say that than mm. he'd anticipated and it turns, I mean, that relationship, part of the reason it ended is because I just am not gay enough to make, you know, to mm. make that an equal part of my sexuality. I really did try. But, like, me and this person, we're still good <laughs> friends. She kind of, like, she describes it as, uh, have you seen Pacific Rim? Yeah. Um, and she says we're drift compatible with men. <laughs> That's great. I love that. For all the for all the fellow nerds out there, you'll be like, oh yeah. Yeah. That's great. I like that. Gosh, there's so much more we want to talk about, but we're gonna take a quick moment now to talk about how you can support this show, keep this growing, and keep this podcast available to everyone out there for free. So these days, while we've all been stuck at home, I know for myself, I've fallen into a trap of just working more and 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 and filling up all my hours with kind of productivity and work related things, which is not great. I don't love that. Yeah, it's not my favorite thing. And so I've really been trying to remember to check in with myself, give myself a breath uh, you know, care for myself in the best way that I can. And I have been finding that our sponsor for this week, Dipsy, is an app that actually has been helping me a lot with that. So Dipsy is an audio app that offers both short, sexy stories, as well as guided meditation sessions, guided self-touch sessions, sometimes just guided check-in sessions that are designed to not only just turn you on, but also help you get in touch with yourself. The stories themselves are also really well produced, nicely immersive, like a tiny bit of scoring or sound effects or things like that, but not overdone. It's not like a 50s radio drama or anything like that. (laughs) Keep it sexy and and minimal. She touched the penis. (laughs) Now, they they keep it sexy, really well done, very nicely produced. Uh, And there's tons of new content all the time, all different types of relationships, different types of sex. And something that I actually am really impressed about this app is that they also have a whole section of just wellness-focused sessions, like Dedeker was mentioning, that are things about like getting in touch with whether or not you might like to dominate or be dominated, or just learning how to touch yourself in a way that feels good, or just this whole range of things uh, that are really cool and definitely something that you can check out, even if you're more into the nonfiction side of things. And for listeners of this show, Dipsy is offering a 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash multi, M-U-L-T-I. That's a 30-day free trial when you go to dipsy, D-I-P-S-E-A, stories.com slash multi. That is dipsystories.com slash multi.
Welcome to this episode of Lube Facts, brought to you by Uber Lube. Did you know that the world's first commercial lube came out in 1904, but it was actually originally patented as a surgical aid, and it wasn't marketed for sexual purposes until 1917? But even then, you needed a prescription for lube. It wasn't until 1980 that you were able to buy lube over the counter. Wow. So over the last 40 years, people have been having way better sex because finally (laughs) lube is available without a prescription. We love Uber Lube and we constantly recommend it to everyone. So Uber Lube offers long lasting performance when you want it and it doesn't leave a sticky residue when you're finished. It just kind of leaves a nice moisturizer feel. And also there's no flavor or scent and it's body safe. So it's free of things like nasty additives, parabens, preservatives, and petrochemicals. All the peas it doesn't have them in there <laughs> and right now they're offering multi-amory listeners a special offer of 10 percent off and free shipping when you use our code multi at uberlube.com that's 10 percent off free shipping just use promo code multi that's m-u-l-t-i at u-b-e-r-l-u-b-e.com So today, not only do we not need a prescription, we can also just order lube online and have it delivered straight to your door. This has been another episode of Lube Facts, brought to you by Uber Lube. Since the beginning of this show, it's been really important to us to make these resources and this information available to as many people as possible. And doing that through a free podcast has been amazing in helping us reach more people to let them know that they are represented, that there are people who understand you and who are working on relationship advice and tools for you and not just if you fit into this one particular mold that's in the movies and the TV shows. And over the last five years, we've been able to grow that reach to so many more people. It's been really amazing. And that's been almost entirely possible just because of people supporting us at patreon.com slash multiamory. Something that's been really beautiful to see is that also in our Patreon community, you know, some of our listeners are able to, for the first time ever, access a supportive community and a support network. You know, we have a lot of listeners who are in remote areas who don't necessarily have access to a supportive community. And our Patreon community has been able to give that to a lot of people, which is really wonderful to see. And so we really appreciate the people who are in our community who choose to support the show. And we want to give back to the people who are going out of their way to help us keep making this show. So some of the cool things that we offer as a thank you include private Facebook and Discord communities just for our Patreon listeners, having early releases on episodes, getting bonus episodes, and also private video discussion groups. We love getting to give back to our community in that way. So if you do want to join this amazing community of people who help make this show possible, go to patreon.com slash multiamory today and become a patron of ours. We'd really appreciate it. So, Lori, as uh, as someone who's also written a book, I hate it when people read quotes from my own book to me, but that's hey, what I'm going to do to you. Hello. So I, <laughs> I hope you can handle it. Uh, so th- this is actually related to what we were just talking about, uh, where you were sharing the experience of, you know, the reality of having two girlfriends, maybe being not quite as fun or not quite as glamorous as we're led to believe that it might be. And there's this quote from your book, Bitch Doctrine, uh, that polyamory is a great many things, but it's not yes. cool. Talking honestly about feelings will never be cool. Discussing interpersonal boundaries and setting realistic expectations wasn't cool in the 1970s, and it isn't cool now. It is, however, oh. necessary. And uh, that is funny. I mean, I definitely know that all three of us have experience, you know, doing interviews about polyamory or people asking all their billion, like, mm-hmm. look kind of questions that it's sometimes hard to sell someone on like, well, I mean, I'm having arguments about the dishes with two different people now, you know, Yay. so and it's it's not quite the endless orgy as, as maybe you think that it sometimes is, but I'm definitely curious about it. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah. yeah. Honestly, when a couple of times I've talked in public about being Polly, um, once I got called a sexual tourist in The Guardian. It was brilliant. 
Sexual, wow. sexual, sexual tourism. Wow. Um, was by another woman. I feel like the Guardian <laughs> put that on a business Yeah, I know. Card. It's sexual like the kind of fulfillment of a lifelong dream, to be honest. But the idea that... Like, <laughs> yeah, Laurie Penny, sexual, sexual tourist, tourist. The Guardian. Um, yeah. But um, <laughs> one of the things I get told often also about being genderqueer is that I'm doing it to be cool. You know, she's just doing it mm. you know, for the attention and because it's the now thing. I'm like, look, have you met Polly Emery? Um, it's not mm-hmm. like we, we were having a discussion, uh, before, um, this started about, um, the universal polyamorous trousers. Um, the, you know, like every <laughs> yes. polyamorous man I have ever met seems to have a version of those trousers. And if you are a polyamorous person listening to this, you know exactly which trousers I mean. Don't pretend that you haven't <laughs> seen them. You may even be wearing them right now. Sometimes they're paisley. <laughs> um, it's, uh, <laughs> but like, well, as my as my British partner says, Paisley Paisley makes it, the girls go crazy. Wow! I might know that guy. <laughs> okay, <Alex. laughs> that's fantastic. I haven't heard that one before. That's really good, <laughs> Alex. If you're listening to Hi, this, why? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, but like, yeah. Polyamory is not cool. Most polyamorous communities I've been part of, uh, there are there is a load bearing amount of deeply nerdy, deeply dorky people, um, which is part of why I love it, because I think nerds are really sexy. Um, but like yeah. the idea, you can't, if you want to be ethical and if you want to have serious conversations about grown up stuff, which is what polyamory kind of requires in order to do it in any way, right. Then you can't really have a quote unquote scene and any poly community I've encountered where it's more about the scene in San Francisco is, um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Burning Man. What was I saying? Um, anyway, <laughs> Burning Man. Um, is, um, yeah, it's going to have problems because, um, yeah, um, honestly, what I'm sure this has been discussed before, but yeah, like, I think there's a reason that I'm going to say both nerds and people who are neuroatypical um, often wind up in polyamory. Um, I'm neuroatypical and um, it's a way of having a system of rules, a system of rules that's subject to change and an amendment and optimization that allows you to actually treat people better and allows you to maybe not hurt people. And um, I appreciate what I deeply appreciate about, appreciate about polyamory, particularly as a British person, is that you have to talk about things. And one thing I find very hard, mm. always have, and I've, I've only recently worked out that, you know, I may be neuroatypical and I'm going through the diagnosis process right now. I really don't like subtext. I really like it when I am able to say exactly what I need and what I think to someone. And I like it even more when somebody tells me their expectations with their words and um, we have a talk about what what boundaries we have what it means I really really like that it makes me feel safe it makes me feel safe to have adventures and to experiment and I think the best poly communities I've been part of make that make that easier um because yeah in Britain really it is true about British people that yeah you're there's a lot of not talking about. I was saying to somebody the other day, um, the whole idea of going out on dates when I was in my early twenties, that it just wasn't a thing. It still isn't really a thing in the UK. Like, um, and they're like, well, what did you do? Um, it's like, well, you get drunk and you sleep together and then you work out. Yeah. And then you work out if you like each other the next day. That's just how <laughs> it's done. Wow. Yeah. But um, now with the, you know, the apps, we've had to, British people have had to learn how to go on dates and it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, geez. <laughs> uh, I, I do feel that, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I've, we've definitely talked on the show before about how there's so much overlap between very deep, deep mm-hmm. nerdy communities and nerdy subcultures, as well as with polyamory and things like that. And it is really interesting on our side of things that because, you know, we've been creating content around it for a while and and that we've kind of positioned ourselves to be like mm-hmm. somewhat visible, that like when journalists reach out to us or sometimes oh producers reach out to us or things like that, there's a lot of people trying 
trying to find yeah, it's cool. not cool. It's <laughs> never gonna be cool. You know, and yeah. and it's like, you know, to make it cool for a TV show, it's gotta also be really dysfunctional usually and maybe hyper sexy and things like that. And it and it I think it's gonna be interesting to see from here because you know, I, as far as what we can see, the trend just keeps on keeping on where more people are feeling more comfortable exploring alternative relationships and exploring anything non-monogamous that, you know, eventually we're going to get mm -hmm. more of a push for us to become yeah. a market for, you know, it's, for capitalism. It's, going. Oh, yes. consume. it's, getting there. it's going, it's <laughs> happening, you know, and I'm just really curious to see how that's going to play Actually, out because I feel like to market to somebody, you have to make your product seem cool to them and they have to seem kind of cool. Also, I've just, I just don't know how it's going to happen. I'm very curious to see. One thing I have found talking about, uh, talking about polyamory to non-polyamorous people, particularly in in Hollywood, where I work now, some of the time, is the assumption that you know if, if everything's if everything's going right in poly world, if we're all polyamorous, then you know there'd be no conflict, there'd be no interest, no drama. You know, how can you write an exciting love story if the if the idea of cheating is not part of it? I'm like, no, it, like. Polyamory just just it just provides different ways for humans to bounce off each other, and and I assure you that there is still drama, so much drama, so so much drama. <laughs> there is a whole untapped gold mine of drama that you can write endless stories about if you um if you wanted to dive into poly world and how it might work. Um, but our yeah our narratives about how our narratives about how romance happens and the drama of romance are so keyed into mm. monogamy that we don't tell. Yeah. You know, talking about how stuff can be difficult and go wrong is part of romance. It's part of it, it's part of yeah. It, it's it's part of the story. It's part of human drama. And I feel that yeah. Obviously, I like it when I see very very rarely when you see representations of polyamory. Sometimes you're seeing them as you know very idealized, and that's good. You know, positive representations are good. But like, I'd like to see people working through the real issues that often happen. Um, it's, uh, oh, in Bojack Horseman, they have, somebody has eight dads. I love, I love, show, I right, love uh, right. yeah, yes. Polly Rock's eight yeah. dads. Like That's fantastic. Lie, um, but I love <laughs> yeah. it when you see them have a little fight. That was wonderful. Like, cause of course mm. they do. There's eight of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah. It, it reminds me too of the, the same thing that we saw with, any sort of mainstream media portrayals of people being gay, mm -hmm. it was like the plot line was just about being gay. Yes, exactly. Like it wasn't really about the relationships. And I think the same thing's true with most of the representations we see, except for some of those side characters like yeah. that, where it's like the polyamory story is the becoming polyamory exactly, story. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. like that's and the only one we yeah. know how to do yet. And, that, and it's still the case with, with homosexuality and bisexuality as yeah, well. Uh, I was recently sure. rewatching yeah. uh, Years and Years, a brilliant Russell T. Davis show. Oh, great and show. Russell, Dav great Russell T. Show. Davis is still one of the only screenwriters out there who portrays real gay relationships where the drama isn't just like you said that oh look they're gay like there's a wonderful right. scene between uh, a guy and his soon-to-be ex-husband where they're just they're sitting in the car together he's trying to persuade he's like saying look can you sign these divorce pa divorce papers and they're just sitting in the car one of them's got a coffee and he's like oh i got you a coffee it's how you like they haven't seen each other for a few months and it's a beautiful little scene where they just they start like teasing each other over you know little you can see that this is a there was friendship there they were together for a reason and then it turns and you work out why it is that they're no longer together. And it's like none of that, all of that drama could have been played in a very similar way between two straight people. But you'd never have, oh, look, the drama is that they're straight. The, right, the sexuality exactly. itself yeah. isn't part of the drama. Exactly. Um, I, I would love to see that. Um, it's not just about normalizing, it's about humanizing. And humanizing involves reminding people that it's not always perfect because people are people. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's, yep, that, that's true. That just reminds me of, uh, I was a guest on, um, the YouTube show, True Tea. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a, yeah, well, a yeah. show. And the, I was the guest to talk about relationship anarchy. And 
she asked her listeners for questions about that and stuff. And, and she told me, she's like, one of the questions I got was, uh, can you ask him why he's such an asshole? And, <laughs> <laughs> what? and she, wait, you specifically or well, all she, all they knew was we're having on a guy to talk about relationship anarchy. What questions do you oh, have? Okay. And the okay. question was, why is he such an asshole? And it was super oh. interesting. I was just like, I was like, yeah, I can kind of see where they're coming from, depending what their experience was with people mm -hmm. using that label. And part of the conversation, part of what we had was this, this conclusion of it really doesn't matter what type of relationship you do. You can still be an asshole. Oh, yes. Oh, for sure. Like, mm -hmm. No relationship style is going to mm -hmm. stop some people from being assholes. And I think that's kind of mm -hmm. like what you're getting at there, too. It's like no relationship style is going to take away just the drama of people trying to get along with each other and communicate Absolutely. with each other. I think the one thing that does happen within poly world is, and I think people are just more awake and aware of this now is occasional straight guys using polyamory as a, as an excuse for misogyny. And in most communities I've known and been part of that is now phasing out because that's, you know, you can only say that for so long and that's not, honestly, it's not been, I've been lucky enough. That that's just really not been the case with most poly people I've known. And most of the people who I've known who have behaved like that, it's like, you're not really, you're not really doing polyamory at all. You're just cheating. And, and one mm -hmm. of the things that is true is that, if you have a person who is just, who just gets off on power and gets off on lies and humiliating people, it's in some ways easier sometimes to see that within Polly because it becomes very clear that if you wanted to do this in an ethical way, you really could. You really could. Nothing hmm. is stopping you sleeping right. with multiple people if you want. What is, but there are some, you know, because power imbalances are literally eroticized within straight sexuality. There are some people who just get off on being an asshole. And um, I think sometimes polyamory is used an excuse for that, but sometimes it makes it easier to weed out, at least in my experience. I, I do find that, yeah, I think a lot of guys who come along with that sort of attitude just fairly quickly end up having a not very fun time in the polyamory yep. community because <laughs> yes. people talk to each other, people communicate. And really I think that all of us, and especially women and female presenting people in that space, are so, uh, like, keyed into that, too. Mm -hmm. to be like, if I catch even a whiff of it, I got to run because I've had too many bad experiences. And so it's, yeah, it's like you're just in a community of people who are already looking for people yeah. like you to be doing this and they're, they're wise to it, I guess. That's absolutely true. And yeah, I mean, back to what we were saying at the start, like there is something very simple and powerful and deeply threatening to patriarchy about just women talking to each other, just women comparing notes. That's all yeah. it takes sometimes. <laughs> yeah. It's um, sometimes about you and that's scary, but like it's um somebody said oh you know what you see in the what is it um the bog art what the bog art turns into in harry potter your worst fear there's like i know so many guys who the oh yeah, yeah yeah the bog art is just going to turn into your ex-girlfriends talking to each other <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's no, pretty powerful. Really, that used to be something that that terrified me if ex-girlfriends of really? mine like in high school talk to mm -hmm. each other i was like oh god oh god oh god oh god oh god <laughs> yeah and it's very different now where i'm like <laughs> Yeah, let's all hang out. You can talk to each other or your friends already or I met you through each other yeah. or whatever it is. So different. It's like that time when all of us were in a room and we were like, "How? what do all of us have in common? <laughs> oh, yeah. We've slept with this person. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. We're all exes with this person yeah. or that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things like that. Yep. Sometimes it is awkward. Uh, there have been a couple of times when I've been that person in the room. It's like, how do we all know each other? Oh, wait. And um, it's not as fun as you think it might be. <laughs> to be that person. No, yeah. It's like, oh, oh yeah. dear. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Are you really going through for it? Really? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I had a, I remember a really fun night during a really hard and dark and not very fun time in my life having an amazing karaoke night out mm. with all other guys who had dated Dedeker in the past. 
And it was Amazing. just wonderful. Like we, like, <laughs> was I at this? No, or no, no. This was just, this was what? just Sad. me and uh, three other guys who were somehow so cool. very close with Dedeker at some point. And we had this amazing <laughs> night out, just the four of us at karaoke. It was wonderful. Oh. Uh, but that always sticks out to me is just like, what do we all have in common? How do we know each other? Well, <laughs> oh, yeah, <it's> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> That's lovely. Beautiful. No, I mean, I've shared this in interviews and on the show before that like some of my just best, because I mean, people always ask the question of like, what are you getting out of this? Why do you like this? And they're really hoping that you're saying that it's sex or things like that, you know? Um, But, you know, I tell people that, yeah, some of my best memories are like going to a house party and I have both partners there and they have their partners there. And also like an ex of mine is there and his new partner. And like, it's not weird, you know? And it's like feeling, it's like this close sense of just like having people around you that care about you big or small in a particular way. And it's like, that has been opened up to me and I've had many more opportunities to connect to that way more since I've been polyamorous than I ever did when I was monogamous in more traditional relationships. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. I think one thing I have found in terms of like, honestly, just friendship with guys is, um, and this is not universal, but just as, I mean, it's a problem in culture where some straight men just find it much, much easier to be open and intimate with people they've slept with. Right. Um, and, mm, but okay. some, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. In like an emotional manner. In any manner. Yeah. And sometimes. 100%. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, sometimes sex with men for me has been just a part, a literal as a part of friendship. It's a getting to know you thing. And sometimes some of my best friendships with men, in fact, probably most of them are with people who I have in the past slept with. Um, because that whole mm. thing is like dealt with. And, you know, that question is answered and it allows a form of right. int- intimacy that, um, that, you know, straight society doesn't often allow between men and women. Um, not that that's, you know, the way that everybody should necessarily conduct their friendships with their platonic friendships. <laughs> um, but yeah, I found right. that, I found it useful and fun. Probably not sustainable in the long term <laughs> with every single friend, but, you know, Sometimes it's not people I've slept with. Sometimes it's people my friends have slept with. So, you know. Yeah, no, yeah that's another good one. It's like, oh, you're yeah. sleeping with my friend. Let's, let's talk. Yeah, you must be nice. <laughs> I just didn't know what you're about. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, we're coming up about at the end of our time now. And I just wanted to say, Lori, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad this finally happened. It's been a, a thank long you. time coming. Yeah, it was so much fun. Thank you for your time, everyone. Lori, for our listeners who want to check out more of your stuff, where is the best place for them to go to get more of that? Oh, well, you can go to my Patreon, which is just forward slash Lori Penny, or you can just search me. And uh, you can go to my Twitter, which is at Penny Red. Um, I don't post a lot on Instagram, but I am on there, I guess. Or you can just, honestly, you can just Google me. <laughs> my books will come up. Um, just bother me on the yeah, internet anyway. It really works pretty well for me, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to be talking with Lori a little bit more in a bonus episode about polyamory being a millennial thing. Uh, so if you want to get involved in that discussion, you can become one of our patrons. We would also lo- just love to hear from you about this episode. What did it bring up for you? What What do you think about it? What do you wish we had talked about? What do you want us to talk to Lori about next time they're on the show? <laughs> The best place to share your thoughts with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com. Multiamory is created and produced by Emily Matlack, Dedeker Winston, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowark and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anan from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 